Good evening, everybody. How's everybody doing tonight? All right, well, welcome uh, space and anthropology fans. This is um, quite the mix tonight. Uh, welcome to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. My name is Kachun Yu. I'm the curator of space science. So I'm an, actually an astronomer, but I don't do planetary science. But, so both the topics tonight are out of uh, my, my field, but uh, I'm really excited to be here um, tonight. And we have three amazing uh, speakers. And um, so I um, will help facilitate the event. We're going to have um, the three speakers, as I said. And we will have a, uh, a Q&A at the end, which I will help with. Um, but um, since we're running um, just a couple minutes late, I'm just I'm going to um, jump right in. And uh, I'm actually not going to introduce um, any of the speakers. I'm going to introduce the introducer of the first speaker. Um, so um, I, I want to um, introduce John Andrews from the Southwest Research Institute. And John is the executive director of the Space Mission Directorate. He is the Lucy Proposal Manager and Science and Science Payload uh, Project Manager. And he's been with SRURI, or the Southwest Research Institute up in Boulder, for um, 25 years. And he actually grew up in Jeffco. So uh, he's a, um, a local boy. And he has been coming to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science since the first grade. So John, I'm going to let you. Um, Take it forward. I'm going to add that to your intro. Uh, yes. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, welcome. Uh, and on behalf of Southwest Research Institute, I would like to welcome you all tonight for what will be a really spectacular evening of talks. Uh, for me, I know for me, and I think for many of you, you'll find. As you grow up, these are probably two themes that really excited you uh, if you're interested in uh, STEM and science, but I think a lot of us were space people and we were paleontology and dinosaur people. And tonight we get to mix those two things and it's gonna be very exciting. Uh, I did grow up uh, in Jeffco. I've been coming to this museum, I won't tell you the year, but it was about the time I was in first grade, which was a very long time ago. Um, so I watched this museum grow and evolve and I remember the old, old dinosaur exhibit before Prius journey started and whatnot. So I want to thank the museum for hosting us here tonight. Um, also, this is a personal evening for me a little bit. And first of all, I'm honored to be able to introduce Hal here in just a second. But many of the Lucy team are here. And Hal might do this. I don't want to steal his thunder. But the reason we're able to be here is because of that team made up of people from across this country. Um, NASA Goddard, Lockheed Martin, Southwest Research Institute, Arizona State University, the Applied Physics Lab, plus the various institutions with our scientists are. And if I may, I would like to, can I thank them? Can we? Yeah, yeah, have should, them stand up. That's a great idea. Stand up. If you're on the Lucy team, stand up. Stand up. Come on, everyone. Stand up, Lucy team. Yay. So um, I've been asked just this morning, actually, to introduce Hal, uh, which I'm going to do. So Hal is the chief scientist at the, uh, the Space uh, Science and Exploration Division in Boulder. Uh, he's a planetary scientist of tremendous esteem and renown. He is a co-author of the NICE model, which I suspect he'll talk a little bit about. I don't know. But it's one of the principal models uh, that defines our understanding of how the solar system formed and evolved. Uh, and for tonight, he's here. He is the principal investigator for NASA's Lucy mission. Uh, being a principal investigator is the top job on the project. Hal led us through proposals in a competitive effort to get us here. And he led us for years to get us here for this thing. Um, I refer to him lovingly as the boss, uh, because he is. He's the, the Lucy boss. And, uh, and with that, on one personal note, I just want to remind you you blame me for getting you here? Mm -hmm. Well, here you are. Congratulations. <laughs> but I would like to introduce from Southwest Research Institute, the Lucy PI, Dr. Harold Levison of Southwest Research Institute. Thank you. Oh, no, no. Hey, hey. So, so first of all, I hope you don't mind I'm going to sit. I've been struggling with a bad back, right? And standing for 20 minutes is probably not a good idea. So I, I uh, hope you don't mind. So if you think about a theme, or you want to come up with a theme for this evening, it's 
how we figure out how we got here, right? And there's several aspects to that particular problem, and you're going to hear about two of them tonight. My particular interest has always been trying to figure out how planets like the Earth formed. So I'm going to start off with a little tutorial about planet formation. At least I think I am. There we go. So the story begins with what we call giant molecular clouds. These are clouds that are light years across, made out of gas and dust. This is a beautiful picture. I hope you can see my pointer taken with the Hubble Space Telescope several years ago of one of these molecular clouds. They tend to hang out. Here's a nice artist conception of our galaxy, right? We're sitting somewhere around here, and they tend to hang out in these spiral arms. And they're huge. They're large enough to be able to see on the scale of the galaxy. Now, you know, the, you might think, wow, that's pretty remote and a long time ago. But I want to point out to you that every molecule in your body, right, was in this molecular cloud as the solar system started to form. And the process that I am going to t talk about today is a process that, again, every molecule in your body experienced as we became who we are. So these molecular clouds, it turns out, can become unstable, and they can collapse. And this is going to be a nice little uh, computer animation of a cloud, collapse of a molecular cloud. Most of the mass en actually ends up in the center of the cloud and making the sun. Because, but because these clouds have a little bit of spin, right? as they collapse, they start spinning faster and faster um, due to the conservation of angular momentum. And you can't fit all the angular momentum that was in these clouds into the star. And as a result, what happens is during this collapse, on the left side, you actually see a measure of temperature on the right, which is where I want you to concentrate in the blue, is density. And you can see the flow of gas in. You form a protoplanetary disk. Like I said, most of the mass ends up in the central star, but almost all the spin ends up in this disk. And that's where planets form. So the first stage of this, so like I said, these things are made out of gas and dust particles. Think of particles of sand or maybe even smaller. They start to grow by accretion. They'll hit one another, and because of electrostatic forces, they will stick. Uh, if my wife, who's here, will forgive me. If you were to look under our bed, you would see the dust clumping and growing into bigger things that I think someday may attack us. Okay. And that's exactly the process that's happening here. Electrostatic forces are letting these things grow. They form clumps, things that we call pebbles, but really they're things that are about maybe the size of my fist or maybe a foot or three feet in diameter. And they are all concentrating towards the, uh, the mid-plane. Oops. Right. If this is, again, a Hubble Space Telescope image, it has a Ryan Nebula in the background, and you can see the optically thick, that's why it's dark, gas disk forming around one of these stars. So once these pebbles end up in the midplane, they actually are affected by the gas they're embedded in and start to clump. So here's a simulation of just a patch of the protoplanetary disk. You don't see the gas. This is just dust, and the color indicates uh, the density of particles. And you get these clumps that are forming that are basically, if you squeeze them all into one object, are about 10 kilometers to 100 kilometers in size. These we call planetesimals. And then the process is pretty straightforward after that. They grow by hitting one another, right? And they hit at low enough velocities that they stick. Here's a little numerical simulation. So they slowly grow over time, and you get Things that, like I said, start out maybe the size of a city and slowly grow up to what we call protoplanets, maybe about the size of the moon or something like that. And then they continue to grow. And eventually, they end up with the solid planets in our solar system, right? either the terrestrial planets in the inner solar system, the ice giants, which are Uranus and Neptune, and the cores of the gas giant planets. 
if an object grows big enough, let's say something like 10 times the mass of the Earth, before the gas disk drains into the sun, what happens is they can accrete gas directly. Oops, I'm going to have to. Well, you can see it on the left hand side. They can accrete gas directly from the nebula. That forms the gla gas giant planets, uh, Jupiter and Saturn. So you end up with something that basically looks like this. At least in our solar system, you have the four rocky terrestrial planets, and then the gas giants on the outside. Remember, all the terrestrial planets are in here. So this process, and this is going to be an important part of what we're going to talk about tonight, is not 100% efficient. And as a result, there's a lot of junk left over, the original planetesimals that went into forming the planets. We call these the small bodies. Okay, now I'm going to turn this diagram around in a way that hopefully will be easier for you to see what's going on. Might be a little bit more complicated. And so what you see here is a plot. Here's a plot with average distance from the sun along the horizontal axis. This is actually logarithmically uh, plotted. So this is one AU. Astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the sun. So the Earth is sitting here. So you're sitting here in this diagram, 10 times that distance. 100 times that distance here. Each of the objects here is an object in the solar system. The size of the dot indicates how big it is. Okay, And then on the y-axis, I plotted what's called eccentricity. It's basically how round the orbit is. If you're sitting down on the x-axis, like Venus, right here, right? that means you're on a circular orbit. And as you move up, the orbit or becomes more and more elongated. That doesn't matter for this talk. Right, I just put that there so everything spreads out so you can see this wonderful plot. So to me, as somebody who's interested in planet formation, this is the money plot. Okay? Because the one thing that we noticed or we learned in the last 20 years or so of uh, studying planet formation is that planets, and if you excuse the pun, this is a dad joke, right? If, don't form in a vacuum. Right? They form as part of a system where they're eating these planetesimals and they're competing with food and they're pushing each other around right, in order to grow the fastest. So in order to understand how a planet like the Earth forms, you have to understand the formation and origin of this entire plot. Okay, So that's what we're intending to do. An example of this is that you know there's a lot of water on the Earth, right? Probably most of the water on the Earth formed out here. And that material rained in as small bodies as the Earth formed. So we have to understand this plot. The planetary community, NASA in particular, understand the strength of this. Oh, I should point out, right, in addition to the, the planets here, the terrestrial planets, right, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. This is Jupiter, and I'll explain this in a minute or two, Jupiter, Saturn. Uranus and Neptune, in addition to the planets, right, there are these small body populations. And they're particularly interesting because unlike the planets themselves, which have evolved due to internal processes over their history, these things have remained relatively fixed and unchanged since they were formed. So one of the best places to go look and figure out how the solar system formed was to go and study these populations. So they're basically the fossils of planet formation. That connection is what led us to name the Lucy mission after the Lucy fossil. Right? By the way, that was named after Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, but it's another story. Maybe Don will say that, uh, talk a little bit about that. Right? So understanding these populations are key. And the planetary community understands that. Here are all the missions that have gone out and studied small bodies uh, over uh, the last few decades. And notice there's one sad population, the green ones here, that have yet to be studied. Those are the Trojans, and that's what we're going after to study. Right. 
So that's what Lucy is doing, and not only is it visiting it, it's doing it in spades. So let me talk about Lucy. Lucy is a tour of the Trojan asteroids. These asteroids are small body populations that lead or follow Jupiter in its orbit. This is Jupiter, so here are the four terrestrial planets, right? And these things, you know, it turns out if you take an object and put it 60 degrees before or 60 degrees behind a mass of planet, it's stable forever. The way to think about it is the gravitational attraction of the sun and the planet plus the centrifugal forces of rotation and orbiting all cancel out. And you put something there, it stays there forever. Okay, so these are ancient populations that are actually the remnants of the formation of the outer solar system. And that's what makes them interesting to us. Loosely launched in October 16th of 2021. Uh, Simone, who's the third author today, is gonna show you some pictures of the launch. It was one of the most beautiful things anybody's ever seen. We're gonna visit two main belt asteroids. Well, I put that in the future tense, but actually as of this week, one of them is in the past tense, and you'll hear about that uh, during Simone's talk. So we're vis we are visiting two main belt asteroids. That's a population of small bodies that, be go that orbit between Mars and Jupiter. Uh, one was last week. The other one is in 2025. And then we're going to have five Trojan encounters from 2027 to 2033 for a total of eight objects because two of our objects have satellites and one, which is my favorite. I know you're not supposed to like one of your kids more than the other, but the last one in particular is my favorite, which is a near equal mass binary, and I'll talk about that in a couple minutes. So why study these things? And I always put this bullet, which I can barely see, the top one on the left, right, on here to remind me to tell you that this is a mission of exploration. I'm a theorist by training, so I'm going to get in, oh, what's this telling us about the formation of the solar system? But really, as I said earlier, we've never seen these objects. And what's more, here's a diagram of the solar system. Because they share an orbit with Jupiter, any small rock that leaks out of the Trojan swarms will get eaten by Jupiter before, before it can get to the Earth. So unlike any other small body solar, um, reservoir in the solar system, this is the only one that isn't supplying us with meteorites. Right? So we are totally clueless about what this population looks like. Now, one of the things when we started uh, studying this population from the ground that was extremely surprising to us, because look, they really occupy a pretty small region of space, is that it's not a homogeneous population. We expected these things all to look the same because they were the leftovers of the for of formation, let's say, of Jupiter's core. And so we were surprised when we started studying from the ground that they really look very different from one another. And there's a lot of ways you could do this. The simplest way is what we, by what we call spectral types, okay, which basically think of them as color. And there, there are three basic spectral types in the, the Trojan swarm. Sorry, Mike, right? Um, the D types, which are really red. The P types, which are sort of red. And then there's a smidge of C's just sprinkled in for good, and they're gr gray, okay? And this is telling us something really fundamental, I think, about the history of the solar system. And what I think is going on is that the solar system formed in a very different configuration than we had before, uh, than we see today. So I'm going to show you the results of something that we call the Nice model. John mentioned it. There are several ideas floating around the literature that can explain this. I'm concentrating on the Nice model because, you know, I came up with the Nice model, so it's <laughs> sort of my idea, okay? And the Nice model says that the planets formed in a, the giant planets formed in a much more compact configuration. Here's Jupiter, Saturn, in this case Neptune, and Uranus, right? The outer ice giant is somewhere about 13, 14 AU. Um, right now, Neptune's sitting out here, right? And what, we, what happens, you can imagine now there's a disk of leftover planetesimals that go just outside the orbit of the ice giants out to 30 AU, right? And you can imagine if these things are all forming at different temperatures 
because they're further from the sun than one another, that the chemistry is different and that represents its different colors on the surfaces, right? If you put all this in the computer, it turns out it's not stable. The orbits of Uranus and Neptune come in, intersect with the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn, which throw them out into this disk. This disk goes kaplooey. Things are flying all over the solar system. We can actually see evidence of this on the impacts on the moon, for example. Okay, and eventually the solar system settles down and basically what we see today, um, this disk is now gone, but a small fraction of them get trapped in the Trojan swarms with Jupiter. And when we do the calculations on a computer, we find that the probability of ending up in this Trojan swarm is independent of where you form. So as a result, the Trojan swarms have objects that form throughout the solar system. So think of how rich that is from somebody who wants to understand the history of the solar system by small, studying these small bodies, we can all go off and go to basically one place and see objects that form throughout the solar system. And that population, by the way, is mainly now gone, right? So this is our only chest to, to study them. So Trojans, as it says, likely harbor objects that form throughout the solar system, right? This diversity, the colors, is telling us something about this uh, migration. But in order to understand what it's telling us about the history of the solar system, you have to cover the diversity. You have to fi uh, visit objects that um, represent everything we see there. And that's exactly what Lucy is going to do. It's going to do it by visiting a large number of Trojans. Here are our targets, right? Remember, I said diversity, so we have, we have two C-types thing. This is everybody's. By the way, I apologize to anybody who's Greek in the audience, OK? Because I don't know how to pronounce these things, so I'm making it up, OK? And uh, Trojans, by the way, uh, are traditionally named after um, characters in uh, Homer's stories. Right, so if I'm, butcher I'm butchering the pronunciation, I apologize. So there's uh, everybody's and a satellite that we discovered with the Hubble Space Telescope that we named Keta. There's uh, Polymeli, and by the, by the way, these are C's, right? There's Polymeli and its satellite, Sean, which was discovered by somebody in this room uh, using uh, occultations where stars move be behind the objects. Uh, there's our P's, uh, there's this near equal mass binary, which I'll talk about in a little bit, which I love, uh, which are P's, and then we have two D's. So I should point out, we are going to more asteroids than any other spacecraft in history. This is a record, right? And we're doing that because of the need to the diversity. But the very cool thing about Lucy, and this was just basically luck, the celestial mechanics gods were really smiling on us, right, is that several of these are interesting targets in and of themselves, and they'd be worth sending a spacecraft to, even if they were the only targets we were going to. So I'm going to talk about a couple of them, starting with everybody's in Keta. Everybody's uh, is the largest remnant of the only major disruptive collisional family in the Trojans. So let me explain to you what that means, all right? You know, who's seen Star Wars? All right, and you, you remember when they're flying through the asteroid belt and there are rocks all over the place? These small body reservoirs don't look like that. If you were standing on any asteroid in the asteroid belt or in the Trojans that didn't have a satellite, and looked around, you wouldn't see another asteroid, right? So that means collisions are actually rare, but they're not unheard of. And so occasionally, right, two of these things will hit one another. They disrupt, right? Fragments go all through the, uh, the solar system, making what we, and we can see these fragments. They're all in very similar orbits to one another, okay? So we could see these asteroid families in the Trojans. Everybody's is the most important one. Um, and so we know that it recently, re recently being a few, a couple billion years ago or something like that, okay, that's how we think, 
right, underwent a collision. Remember, when I went through my um, Planet Formation 101 slides, really, if you think about it, collisions and, di and orbits are the only thing that matters when you talk about planet formation, right? So here is a laboratory that actually allows us to study a collision. We've never visited an object like that before, and I'm sure we'll learn a lot by going and visiting an object like that. Um, I want to talk about my favorites, the binary. Okay, this, this thing blew my mind when I first saw it. Right, this is two objects, look at this, that are almost exactly the same size, that are in circular orbits around one another, right? Uh, here's a picture by, taken by Keith Knoll with the Hubble Space Telescope. Keith's in the audience, right? Um, actually, they're not resolved here, so you can't see the objects themselves, but the fact that they're the same brightness tells you they're the same size, right? But we've been able to measure the size uh, independently. This is really weird, and it's very rare, okay, in, let me call it, the inner solar system. And by this phrase, I mean anything inside the orbit of Neptune. But if you go out into the regions beyond Neptune, into a region that we call the cold classical Kuiper Belt, which is beyond the reach of Neptune, they're all over the place. Almost every object that we look at is a near equal mass binary. You can see these Hubble Space Telescope images of these things, and notice they're almost the same brightness, right? And then when uh, New Horizons flew by Arakoth, which is one of these bodies several years ago, you can see they're almost an equal mass binary too. So that's telling us something fundamental, right, about how these things form. And I think um, they form as a result of a collapse. So remember, I showed you the slide before, right? And I said you get these pebbles in a gas disk floating around. The aerodynamic drag with the gas disk makes them concentrate, and they collapse. But what I didn't say in that initial introduction is that when they collapse, they have spin. They have angle momentum. And so as they collapse, right, what happens is, again, you can't fit all that spin in one object. And as they collapse, what you see is that you form binaries that are almost the same size. Okay? So the, the takeaway is that I think that a large fraction of the objects that first form in the solar system that were first bigger than, let's say, the size of my fist were these equal mass binaries. And this is consistent with making things that are about a, 100 kilometers in size. That's true. This binary is one of the few, I should say, the reason why they're rare in the inner part of the solar system is that planet formation is so violent that they got torn apart and didn't survive. If that's true, this is one of the real rare leftovers from this primordial population. And that's why I'm so excited to go see this object. I'm also going to talk about Sean and Palomelli for a similar reason. We studied Sean for various reasons quite heavily um, uh, using stellar occultations. So it's the smallest of our targets, and we were worried that uh, some of our software wasn't going to work. So we studied this. We found a satellite, Sean, about five kilometers in orbit. But the really remarkable thing about this, po this object is its shape. Um, Palomelli is shaped like a hamburger. And when we first saw that, we were like, huh? Right? How do you do that? Right? And it turns out that this collapse mechanism that I talked to you about before for the binary also works for um, Palomelli. Again, this is a, um, a collapse, but it's got less spin in it than the one I showed you before. You get these nice spiral arms, and you get these nice clumps, and if you focus in one of these clumps, it's a nice, flat, hamburger-shaped thing, right? So again, I think Palomelli is a primordial object. So with one mission, we're seeing two of these ancient things. 
Um, as I said before, we are also visiting two uh, main belt asteroids. Um, the one we went to last week, we called Dinkinash. By the way, we named these things, which is why they have a theme for Lucy. Dinkinash means uh, Lucy in Ethiopian language. And the other one is uh, named after Donald Johansson, who you're going to hear from in a couple minutes. I should have left that for the segue. But I've gonna, I have one more thing to say. We have more uh, diversity than just the colors. We have large mass ratios. As I've already talked about, we have objects that have very different collisional histories. So we're really covering the gambits here. So I'm going to end by pointing out that before Lucy, nine main belt asteroids have been studied by spacecraft. Uh, here are the nine. And they revolutionized our view of how rocky planets formed. Lucy, in one mission, will visit almost as many, uh, and we expect it to revolutionize our understanding of the outer planets as much as these objects revolutionized our understanding of terrestrial uh, planet formation. By the way, it's not nine anymore, it's 10 as of last week, thanks to Lucy. And I will stop saying, <laughs> I love Lucy. Okay, so I now introduce Tong. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Donald Johansson. It was an honor the day I met him. So, uh, and, and I printed out a, some of his honors and accomplishments. So let me start out <laughs> uh, with the discussion. Oh. So anyway, um, when we first got selected with Lucy, I decided to reach out to Don. Um, and I must admit, I don't know if you know the story. I sent you an email, right, which I know you know about, right? But it was months before I ever heard back, right? And, um, and I thought, oh, this big shot, he doesn't want to talk to me. You know, I'm only a lowly planetary scientist. Right? Then I got an email from him that said, I'm sorry I haven't responded before, but I've been in Borneo. <laughs> and so, I mean, I mean, you know, and it turns out as I've gotten to know him, he is one of the nicest and modest people I've ever uh, been able to get to know, particularly for a scientist. Uh, modesty is rare, as you can probably tell. Okay? So, as you know, Donald discovered uh, uh, our mission's namesake, the Lucy Fossil. He's also uh, a founding member of um, the Institute for Human Origins in Phoenix. So I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, oh, so that's Advance. Down is Advance, and that's the uh, oh, laser. Thank okay. you. of the universe. And uh, it's so appropriate to be here at this museum because, and all of you I'm sure have noticed, 
its street address is 2001. <laughs> like the Space Odyssey. Remember, you've all seen that movie, I hope. And uh, remember old Nasty Hal, the computer that was <laughs> built in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, and uh, my first exposure to artificial intelligence. Um, but it's appropriate because not only of the street address, but because of the fact that we are looking into the vast corners of the universe and uh, talking about the origins of humankind. And you may remember in that film, it opens with ape-like creatures picking up bones and s slaughtering, which w are called tapers, Interestingly, when that film was made, tapers had not yet been found in Africa, but they have been since. And uh, there you are with anthropology in your face, and then they get on the space station and go out into space. So I can't think of a more interesting combination of street address, anthropology, and astronomy, which are, of course, both first in the alphabet. <laughs> Um, I was uh, in, I wasn't in Borneo, I was in Bhutan, and uh, I got this odd email from uh, Hal, and, and he told me, he said, this may be the strangest email you've ever received. And of course, he hasn't seen the emails I've seen. We get some pretty <laughs> weird ones at uh, the Institute of Human Origins that uh, I founded way back in 1981. Uh, one of the humorous ones not long ago was a little girl who was in seventh grade wrote in and said, if Dr. Johansson is still alive, <laughs> could, you know, all, most people who are well known are dead, right? Um, she said, could you ask him if Lucy was married? But it, it, it was such a cute email and I answer all of these emails from students. But uh, I was in Bhutan, and he said, this may be one of the strangest emails you've ever received. And the essence of it was that I am, Hal, proposing to NASA, at the cost of a billion dollars, right, to launch a mission to study these asteroids uh, that are in Jupiter's orbit. And I feel that as your Lucy discovery, had helped us understand the origins of humankind. The study of these asteroids will help us understand the origins of our solar system. I couldn't have said it more eloquently. And uh, what you heard tonight is that the mission is, of course, and you'll hear a lot more from Simone, but how well the mission is going. And it is just absolutely extraordinary. Uh, you know, as a anthropologist stumbling around Africa looking for fossils and uh, getting this email was quite remarkable. And then being invited to Lockheed to see them assembling the, uh, the, the craft itself uh, blew my mind for a number of reasons because everybody who was walking down any hallway or disappearing into any office had Lucy mission and Lucy on their jackets or their shirts. And there was more Lucy's that I've ever seen in my life. And I gave a talk there and at the end of it, nobody applauded, they all just went, go Lucy. <laughs> and it was pretty humbling to think about how this single discovery of a, an, a an ancestor who lived 3.2 million years ago died along a lake margin and it was interred for those 3.2 million years and once, once she was sort of reanimated by the process of erosion and exposed on the surface of the ground, some anthropologist came along and spotted a particular bone that led to her skeleton. And uh, there is something very, very mind-blowing <laughs> about all of those events. And I have 
always uh, been interested, and I will tell you a little bit more about that, but to a fundamental question, maybe the most fundamental question that all of us ever remember answering as an infant or a child. You know, mommy, where did I come from? And uh, I can take, I'm staying on terra firma, by the way, I'm not going to be going out into space or the solar system. But um, as, we, as we have now learned, we're the only species we know of, and I'll, at the moment, I will say, in the universe, which is, as I said before, is a pretty big place, that actually has the ability to ask that question of its own origins. And if we were on another planet, you know, I'm, as I say to people who say, well, you know, once we use a, a Earth's resources, we'll just move somewhere else. Yeah, why? Right. Where are you going to move to? Uh, but the point is that we are a creature that actually asks those questions and actually goes out and begins to theorize about that, as Charles Darwin and Thomas Henry Huxley did, and then to implement a word that Hal used, exploration, to go out and discover the evidence that has been left behind, in my case, the fossilized remains of our ancestors, and begin to put together a fascinating picture of how we came to be, whether fortunate or unfortunately, in charge of this planet. So we're going to talk about who Lucy was. As you can tell, I'm a professor at the uh, Arizona State University. <laughs> there are Arizona State University people here from, okay, great. And former students, some of our former students are right here in the front row and colleagues from, from East Africa. So uh, I feel like I'm kind of uh, being, uh, it's sort of like gladiatorial, see I'm down here. And, Soon the lion's going to come out from behind me and challenge me. But we'll see if we can make it through, and if we can't, these guys will fill in for us, uh, for me. Uh, there we are. So the question is, what, how did a little kid growing up in Hartford, Connecticut, next door to a theological seminary, end up becoming interested in Paleoanthropology, which I always say is not the study of old anthropologists, <laughs> but the study of human origins. Well, I had a mentor when I was growing up who was teaching anthropology. He was teaching, I'll say it softly, missionaries. And um, he was, uh, became my mentor uh, at around age nine. And he gave me the greatest present whatsoever, and that was uh, the love of books and knowledge. Because in my home, we didn't have very many books. I didn't know there were that many books in the world. And he knew of my interest in biology. I was very interested in uh, the, uh, the woods that were near my house, the river that ran by. I would go out and collect butterflies and, and and lightning bugs and salamanders and watch rabbits uh, uh, tend to their young. And I was very interested in the natural world. And I very quickly, through under his guidance, began to understand that if we are in search of a creator, the answer is nature. Nature is our creator. And as I say today, would we be doing to, would anybody be doing to their creator what we are doing to what our creator, which is the natural world? So he took a very slim book off of the shelf called Man's Place in Nature, written in the late 1800s by Charles Darwin's sidekick Thomas Henry Huxley. I didn't read The Origin of Species because it didn't have any pictures in it. It had one black and white diagram that I didn't really understand at the moment. And this book had pictures of fossil specimens like Neanderthals uh, and so on. And the seminal idea that grabbed me at this moment of incredible inspiration was that we and the African apes share a common ancestor. And to me, that was 
an epiphany. And I had the sense, wow. And then towards the end of the book, he says, someday some unborn paleontologist will find a human more ape-like or an ape more human-like. And I thought, well, I was unborn when he wrote that. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to go to Africa, just like my mentor did. And uh, indeed, uh, that's where I went. And this was the diagram that was so important in the book to me. And that is uh, Huxley's drawings of the various apes. Gibbons, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, and so on. And as Darwin wrote in his, the last sentence of his Descent of Man book in 1871, uh, an indelible stamp of our lowly origins lies in our skeletons. And how prescient was he? And how prescient was Huxley when he said that there will be a common ancestor found eventually? We haven't found it yet, but certainly the anatomical makeup of these apes, the naked one on the right, as Desmond Morris called us, the naked ape, and chimpanzees and gorillas are remarkably similar with important differences in locomotion and, of course, in the size of our brain. So the place to go was Africa. I studied as an undergraduate anthropology uh, in Champaign-Urbana. I did my PhD at the University of Chicago, and I corralled one of my professors, the late Professor Clark Howell, who was coined the word paleoanthropology, and got him to take me to Africa, where he had an expedition. And uh, that was in 1970. And once I flew over the Great Rift Valley with Clark in front of the airplane, this was a little four-seater airplane, on the way up to southern Ethiopia, I knew that this place was where I wanted to be. And uh, the Rift Valley is very visible from space. Uh, I've met a number of astronauts who have remarked on it uh, from circling the globe. And it runs from Mozambique in the south all the way up into the uh, intersection of the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. It's a line of geological instability. It's part of tectonics, plate tectonics. And the uh, Somali and Ethiopian part is slowly moving away from Africa, creating this uh, stunningly beautiful geological phenomenon. Uh, and here, just to give you a little sense of where we are, you can see the uh, Rift Valley in Ethiopia. It's actually called the Ethiopian Rift Valley. And it continues northeast to a triangular area known as the Afar Triangle, which is the intersection of three rifting systems above the ocean floor, which is, which is what every geologist dreams of. And uh, there's a site known as Hadar. And this site had been explored in the late 1960s by a French colleague of mine who asked me to accompany him on an exploratory expedition in 1972. And this is what we saw. This is really, for me, the El Dorado of paleoanthropology, the Afar region. This is the site known as Hadar, which is a local place name for the Muslim tribesmen who live there. And you can see the beautiful erosion and e exposure of these geological strata, which are generally horizontal and uh, often very fine grained. So they were laid down in calm water. They stretch over long distances. And there are a number of white layers that we see in there in the distance, uh, just before the Green River. Uh, the trees along the riverine, uh, at the riverine forest in the distance. And those white layers are volcanic ash layers. And using argon dating, I knew we could date the age of these deposits. I knew that, already knew that this was old. And for us, old was three million years. And in, 19, in, the, in 1970, there were very few fossils known older than three million years. You could fit them into the palm of your hand. 
and we knew very little. We knew about Australopithecus uh, from Eastern Africa and Southern Africa. We knew about Homo erectus uh, and so on, but we didn't know very much about those early ancestors. And the site, as I said, was fairly low energy. Here you see in a beach sand a 3.4 million year old elephant that's being excavated by one of our expedition members. Still pretty much articulated. Whoops. I told you this was a difficult thing to use. Uh, there we go. So this is the delightful, inviting environment in which we spend two and a half, three months a year. I'm sure you've spotted our camp right there, that little white dot where people, scientists, students, and some in this room who have been to this place, um, spend an enormous amount of time trying to reveal and understand our earliest human ancestry. This is a, a lower down picture at camp level. We have a permanent source of water that runs through here. Those are our tents for sleeping and research tent and a dining tent. And uh, we spend quite a bit of time in very large groups, as you can see, of Ethiopian scholars, American scholars, French scholars, Afar, uh, local Afar people who have become some of the best fossil finders we've ever had and who have been fascinated with this whole idea that, that we're talking about millions of years. We heard about billions of years, but millions of years all this time. It's hard for us to put our, our, our head around. And when you tell the Afar people, who, the Muslim people, uh, that these are very, very ancient, they're, they're, they interpret that in that Lucy's species, Lucy's kind, was the progenitor of all people on the earth today. Therefore, we are all descended from their tribe. Isn't that fascinating? So you have geologists, paleontologists, archaeologists, uh, and of course, anthropologists. Uh, so how do you find these fossils? Uh, we don't have a uh, craft like the Lucy craft to go out there and find them for us. Uh, we have to just simply walk that landscape and hope to see, whoops, I told you this is a challenging for me, Hal. So you have to walk the landscape in this sort of a bent over position, looking and looking and looking and hoping that your eyes will fall on an object that you recognize as being important. The first discovery that was made was this knee joint in the middle, this very lovely preserved uh, knee. Of, it's about 3.4 million years old compared with a chimp on the left and a human, uh, or is it the other way around? I guess it's a human on the left, right? And the chimp on the, on the right. And it's very, it's identical to everybody's knee in this room. So it meant that they were, they possessed one of the cardinal features of what it means to be on the human family tree rather than the ape family tree. That is upright walking. Think of how many other animals on this planet walk on two legs, like none, maybe birds. But um, that's one of the hallmarks of uh, our early human ancestors was upright walking. And this is the spot. Oh, yeah right there where the first fragment was found. This is colloquially called the, the Lucy site. And uh, there are people working there just two days after my discovery. And I was out with one of my students uh, walking like that. And what I spied on the ground was this little wrench-shaped bone. It's an elbow bone. And we know elbows stick out, and this bone certainly did stick out. And uh, I recognized immediately that the anatomy of this bone was not like the anatomy of an antelope or a monkey or anything else. It had to belong on the human family tree. And as we looked up this slope, here's my former graduate student, Tom Gray, um, we saw pieces of a skull, we saw pieces of an arm, we saw pieces of a leg, uh, we saw the, a part of the pelvis, and we realized that we had an associated skeleton. 
We're excited when we find a piece of jaw with a tooth in it. But to have something like this at more than three million years was incredibly important for us. And uh, we were celebrating in camp, uh, and uh, one, of the, one of the expedition members who was, we were listening to a Beatles tape, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and it was playing Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, and she said, well, if you really think this is a female, and I did because of the very small size, she's only reconstructed about three and a half feet tall, and she's a full adult because her third molars are erupted. Uh, and uh, she said, why don't you call it Lucy? After Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, I said, well, you know, I'm actually a professor or a PhD, and I, I don't think we should call it, give her a cute little name like that. And it was too late. The next morning at breakfast, oh, we're going to the Lucy site. How old do you think Lucy was when she died? <laughs> you think Lucy had children? So, and, and what it did was it evoked an image of an individual, of a person. Not just a fragment of jaw, but a person. Dated at 3.2 million years, and eventually, I know I'm going to press the wrong button here. Hal, you might have to come up here and help me. There it is. Got Why don't you hand it to me and just say next slide? Oh, that's I, I've got it now. Uh, yeah, that, that's what they all say. Uh, well, I, I struggled with the two. Yeah. You know how men never want to ask directions? You know, that's, that's that <laughs> sort of thing. So we gave it a name in 1978. We didn't know who that knee joint was. But with this and many other fossils, which I'll show you very briefly, we realized that it was different and unique and separate from all other species that had ever been found of early human ancestors. And we gave it the name Australopithecus, which was inherited from the first discovery in Johannesburg in 1924, uh, uh, and named it after the Afar people in Afar region, and it is uh, known as Australopithecus afarensis. And if you ever travel to Ethiopia, you can travel to the Afar region, you can travel to the Afar site, and the government has put a stone marker at the point where she was discovered in 1974. Uh, you heard the name Dinkanesh. Dinkanesh is an Amharic word, uh, which means you are wonderful. If you are in Ethiopia, and you are dating an Ethiopian lady or woman, you, and you called her Dinkanesh, she'd be really very happy um, that she was called You Are Wonderful or You Are Beautiful. And in 1985, the Ethiopian government issued this commemorative stamp of Lucy. Uh, a reconstruction has been done of her entire skeleton, as you see there. And what's important is they're walking upright. And that prompted an academic tornado like you cannot believe. People did not want to accept that people were, that our ancestors were walking fully upright that many years ago. And in 19, in just shortly after Lucy was found in 75 and 76, uh, this site in Tanzania known as Laitoli, uh, where there is a volcanic ash that came down like a snowstorm, there were at least two of Lucy's relatives who walked across that landscape. And since they weren't wearing shoes, they left their footprints, just like the ones we leave in a beach sand. And a close-up look of that foot shows you the very dominant great toe, the deep heel strike, the longitudinal from front to back and side to side arch to the foot. And that is a foot that walked very similar, almost identically, to the way we walk today. And imagine 3.2 million years later, somebody left a footprint on an extraterrestrial place on the moon. And it's fascinating to think of that connection between the past and the present and the accomplishments of science. Uh, these are just to dazzle you with the great number of specimens of her species. We now have probably uh, over 400, 450 specimens that represent every part of the body, even the little delicate hyoid bone that is very ape-like, so I don't think they were sitting around talking like this. They were grunting more, uh, whatever they were trying to communicate. 
And uh, we have, this is probably the most important reference collection for early hominid evolution from anywhere in Africa. The one thing that we were disappointed with in the 70s was that we didn't have a skull. And we've gone back and found a female skull and a male skull. And you can see that there's quite a difference in size, that males were much larger than females. And we are, have done reconstructions of what males and females would look like. There is, uh, we've found infants, uh, and we know, for example, uh, what infants look like, and because of, of scanning techniques and so on, and in-depth studies of the teeth, we can say something about how quickly they matured, et cetera. And uh, so we're, we're beginning to get insights in how a baby Australopithecus afarensis grew up to an adult afarensis. We're also beginning to understand more closely what kind of environment they lived in. It wasn't an open savanna grassland. It was probably a, a, a woodland, uh, as you see reconstructed here by Mauricio. And here they are dining al fresco, uh, which of course, where else would they dine? But here they are. They were essentially frugivores, I think, or certainly herbivores. Uh, they were probably eating honey and ants and termites and all of those sorts of things. But we do know from a conglomeration of spe specimens we found in one geological layer of adults, males and females, adults and infants, that they were living in groups. And uh, just today in Science, there was an article published about what insights we might gain from studying bonobos, which are sometimes called pygmy chimpanzees incorrectly, and studying the sort of Jane Goodall chimps might help us understand what their social structure and social behavior was like. This is the biggest misconception about human evolution, and that is because they're drawn by Homo egocentricus. <laughs> this guy up here, whoops, uh, this guy on the right. You know, e it, evolution was, the pinnacle of evolution was a white European male. Right? Because white European males drew these. And uh, the illustration in Darwin's book said that the tree of evolution of any group is, has many branches. Uh, a family tree such as this, or a phylogeny as we call it. And you can see Lucy's species there as Australopithecus afarensis. We're not going to, uh, all of these other names will not be on the final exam. Uh, and uh, she seems to sit at a very pivotal place in terms of climate change in Africa, in terms of faunal change, and also as a potentially uh, recognizable ancestor to various branches, most of which went extinct, except the one that ultimately evolved into ourselves. So this is a reconstruction that I did for a television series I did a number of years ago. There's a movement specialist inside that suit named Ilsa Burke, and we sent her down to this uh, edge of a lake. And thinking about, you know, I was an astronomy kid when I was small. I had my own telescope that I bought with my newspaper delivery money and so on. And uh, being out in Africa in these remote places, and you look at the sky, you're really humbled. You're just fascinated. You're, you're, you feel, you really feel like we are so fortunate to be alive. There are, I mean, uh, how many billions of stars out there, right? Is there anyone on another star, on another solar system listening to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony? I doubt it. But we are so uniquely fortunate to have been born and to have the opportunity to expand our understanding of the universe. Now, before I stop, I'm going to thank you very much for listening. And I have the great pleasure of introducing my great friend, Simone Marchi, an Italian, obviously, uh, who is a staff scientist at uh, Southwest Research in Boulder. And his interests cover the formation and geology of the terrestrial planets, the moon, and asteroids. And boy, is he busy. 
Um, he's the deputy principal investigator for the NASA Lucy mission and co-investigator of the NASA Psyche mission, both of which are connected to Arizona State University, I'm proud to say, to the NASA Dawn mission and the ESA Bepi Colombo. So please welcome uh, Simone, who is going to give us some unbelievably mind-boggling insights into what is happening with the Lucy mission. Thank you, Don. I have to say that that, that was one of the best um, Italian pronunciation of my names, <laughs> which is typically butchered uh, pretty heavily, so thank you for that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, it is my pleasure uh, to be here tonight and uh, share uh, some exciting news with you about the Lucy mission. But before getting into the details, I would like to give you an introduction of Lucy, uh, the, the spacecraft this time around. And uh, for that, I would like to show a rendering of our uh, beloved spacecraft. What you're seeing here is almost a real size uh, spacecraft and you will notice the most prominent features are these uh, solar panels, this massive structure on uh, both sides of the spacecraft. This is what's needed in order to give power to the spacecraft uh, being able to operate at great distances from the sun. Another interesting feature just for reference is this a conic structure, that is the high gain antenna, we'll talk more about that in a minute, and that is, the diameter of that feature is about uh, my height. So just to give you a perspective. Now with that said, let me show you a little bit about the instrumentation that we carry on. So all the scientific instrumentation is mounted onto the instrument platform that you see here at the top. We have LoLaurie, which is a high resolution camera. Think of a small telescope. Then we have LoRalph, which is a color imaging, imager, so you can take uh, pictures uh, in colors, plus a spectrometer in the near infrared. That's something that's used in order to infer the compositions of our target. Then we have LATES, which is a thermal emission spectrometer, so longer wavelengths. And what that does to us, it tells, it, tell, it tells us the temperature of the surfaces plus information about the roughness. We have TTCAM. These are two identical small cameras, low resolution, and are needed in order for the spacecraft to keep tracking as our target as we fly by plus they provide some additional data for, for scientific investigation. And finally, uh, the structure we mentioned a moment ago, the high gain antenna, this is not really a scientific instrument per se. In fact, it's what we use to communicate back and forth with the spacecraft. However, we can use this in order to infer if there is a deflection of the trajectory of the spacecraft as it fly by an asteroid. And if there is a deflection, then we can infer the mass of our target. Now here is, um, uh, is a picture of this instrument platform as it was assembled. Now I would like to stress that this was assembled at Lockheed Martin facility in South Denver where the spacecraft was built and, and, and all the instruments were assembled and tested. So this is really, there's lots of Colorado in, in, um, in the Lucy mission. And so you, if you can compare now with the rendering on the right hand side, you sort of can find your way and identify the various instruments as they were uh, mounted in onto the platform. And so you see it's a very complex structure and it's nice that there, e there is a human next to it so you can actually get the sense of how massive this structure is. Well, what do we do with this instrumentation? We have briefly uh, talked about this in uh, Hal Levison talk, uh, but let me give a little bit more detail. So the one thing that we can do is to look at the high resolution images of our target. So for instance, we can look for craters, mounds, rocks, cracks, and interesting features that could be on the surface. And that is what give us information about the geology of these objects, how they formed and evolved. Now, next thing we can use our spectral uh, instrumentation. And so we can take color images of our target or even try to map um, minerals, and so the compositions. So what you see here is, in fact, um, a map, color uh, map of the distribution of crystalline water rise on uh, Charon, the larger satellites of Pluto that was obtained with the similar instrumentation that we carry on on Lucy. And then uh, we briefly uh, mentioned this. We can 
Um, we can measure the mass of our target as we fly by. We can use the pictures in order to infer the volume of our targets, and therefore we get the density. Now, what do we do with the density? Well, the density is an information about the interior structure of these objects, right? So, for instance, it could be something that's more of a competent, hard piece of rock, or maybe something we call a rubble pile, which means a loose collection of rocks. So we can, we can discern between these two extremes. And finally, we will also look for satellites and rings as we fly by. But Hal showed this earlier, right? So we have a rich selections of targets. We want to fly by many Trojans. And why we want to do that? Because diversity is key. Right, these are very different one of another, and so looking at just one Trojan wouldn't really give us uh, a sense of the picture. So we need to fly by lots of them. And so really what's enabling this is uh, Lucy's uh, trajectory. In fact, we can say that the heart of the mission is really the trajectory. And so here is what the trajectory looks like as it unfolds in space. So we have a couple of loops in the inner solar system. We cross the main belt, meaning we have an opportunity to look over a couple of main belt asteroids. Eventually, we head out toward the Trojans, um, approaching the L4, so the leading uh, cloud of Trojan asteroids. And we have four encounters over a time span of 15 months. After that, the spacecraft bounces back towards the inner solar system, close encounter with the Earth, and heads out again to meet the last target. Patroclus and Menatia system. So this is really what enabled the rich science that comes out of this mission, the ability of studying many different objects scattered across the solar system. Now, let me bring you back a couple of years ago. Not many of you perhaps, perhaps had an opportunity to, to witness the launch of the spacecraft, so I just wanted to share a couple of pictures. This is, of course, taken up close. Just a couple of seconds after liftoff, this was on October 16, 2021, it was an early morning launch, perfect conditions, and what you see here is an Atlas V rocket, and of course uh, the Lucy mission was nested here uh, at the top of the rocket. But I wasn't really this close to the, to the rocket, yeah, that would have been kind of dangerous. So, but for reasons you will see in a minute, actually I was really in a good spot, because this is basically what I saw for where I was standing. So sort of perfect position. Um, and so what you see here, this is, was, of course, from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. You see the rocket um, uh, departing, and then the rocket disappeared. And so everybody said, oh my god, it's gone. It's, it's you know, game over. Let's go away. We don't see anything else. And the split second after, the rocket came up on the other side, creating this wonderful uh, scene of, uh, as you see, right, lights and shadows. It was truly an amazing experience. So this is how uh, Lucy's uh, billion miles uh, journey began. And so let me now jump forward um, to the future. I said I'm going to share you some exciting news from the missions, and so it's now time to get to that. Um, as the Lucy left Earth, uh, the science team uh, realized that, that the Lucy spacecraft would naturally come to fly by close to a small main belt asteroids. In fact, within 69,000 kilometers apart. Now that's, if you think at the scale of the solar system, it's basically nothing. It's really, really close. And so when we saw that, uh, we realized that we had an opportunity to fly by um, even closer to this object. And so we decided to adjust the trajectory of the spacecraft and uh, be able to achieve a very close uh, flyby with a distance of 430 kilometers. Uh, that's more or less the distance from Boulder to Pueblo, Colorado, just to give a sense. So extremely close. Um, the asteroid was named Dinkinesh, which, as we have heard, is an Ethiopian name uh, for Lucy the Fossils and means you're marvelous. And so what I'm going to show you next is some uh, preliminary results from, from this flyby that took place just a few days ago, November the 1st. So the first thing I'm going to show you is a movie that basically it's built by stitching together hundreds of frames of images that were taken by high resolution camera that we have on board. And so as this unfolds, you have a sense that the object is coming closer to you. You start seeing lots of details on the surface. And then um, we fly on the other side and we look back. And so this is the, the asteroid's Dinkinesh as it appeared to us. Um, and of course, everything worked um, 
uh, as planned. And as you can see from this data, it was really um, uh, an amazing experience. So let me uh, show you an high resolution picture. Uh, one of the best pictures we have taken, but there is something strange here. You, have, you know, probably have already realized that by looking at the movie. Well, Dinkinesh is not one object. It turns out there is a satellite, and we didn't really know that. So, major surprise, right? Because not only we have the main object that we knew was there, but uh, there is a companion. Now, this picture also shows uh, lots of details. Remember, we talked uh, earlier about uh, geology of these objects, why that's important. And so this uh, shows that our instrumentation is capable of giving us a great deal of details of the surfaces of these objects. And so we can now start understanding how these objects formed. But that was not it. In fact, as we were leaving the Inkinesh and the spacecraft was looking back, we had uh, a different view of the satellite which is shown here from the side. And all of a sudden, the satellite is actually made of two objects that are in contact. And so we set ourselves to fly by an asteroid and they ended up with three. So you can imagine that um, certainly we were surprised, uh, but that also means we have more work to do now. So, you know, things may balance out in the end. <laughs> all right, let me show another picture. Um, we stressed earlier how is it important for the Trojans to study their colors, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's really a, 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 a most interesting um, a scientific endeavor that we want to do with the Trojans. And so here we are showing that our instrumentation was properly, and in fact, this is a color image uh, based, it's high, highly stretched, and it's also preliminary data. Um, but this shows that we are able to pull up colors from, from our target. There is, um, I would like to give a sort of a bigger picture now, try to compare what we have seen with Dinkinesh with the other, th other asteroids we have seen in the past. And so here I'm showing a comparison with other main belt asteroids that we have si visited with spacecraft in the past. And these are the smallest we have seen so far. And you will notice that uh, Dinkinesh stands out as being the, sm the smallest uh, main belt asteroids ever visited. And so this allows us to compare with other objects in the main belt, but also allows us to look at the class of objects that we haven't seen before. And there are many of those objects there. So this enables us to have a better sense of how these objects formed. And uh, finally, we can also compare with another class of asteroids that are closer to Earth. These are so-called near-Earth objects. And so what you see here is a collection of some of these asteroids that have actually visited by spacecraft in the past. You may recognize some of these names. For instance, asteroid Bennu was visited by the NASA OSIRIS-REx spacecraft. And in fact, the spacecraft brought back samples from these asteroids just very recently. And so now we can compare the uh, geology of, of, of Dinkinesh with that of other uh, siblings asteroids of similar size. And there's always one thing that stands out up front, that the fact that Dinkinesh has a satellite, and none of these objects that we see in the slides have, have a satellite. And so that clearly makes it interesting. And um, let me now uh, say a few words about the future. Right? What does come next? Well, the first thing is that uh, the the Lucy team is clearly busy analyzing the wealth of data, um, thanks to the Dinkinesh flyby. But there is really no time to relax here because we have a pretty packed uh, agenda coming up. And so starting from February 2024, uh, it's, uh, we will have a major event on the spacecraft, that's so-called the deep space maneuver, is when the main engine on the spacecraft will be turned on for the first time. This is needed in order to adjust the trajectory of the spacecraft. Then, a uh, few months after that, we'll have a flyby uh, of the Earth for the second time. And again, that's needed to adjust the trajectory of the spacecraft and eventually be able to reach the Trojan asteroids. And a few months after that, we will have a flyby of Donna Johansson. Now, that is not the man, Donna Johansson, that's <laughs> with us here, but of course, it's the asteroid named after him. And so that would be a very exciting opportunity for us to learn something new about, about other asteroids. And with that, I will uh, stop here. We will have a Q&A session now. And there is a couple of other things I want to say. We will move to a reception area after we are done with the Q&A. And because there are lots of uh, Lucy folks here, 
some of them will have this tag. And so if you are curious of asking questions, don't come to us, go to them, right? <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke, huh? Thank you for your attention. it anywhere? I think so. All right. Okay, we're going to have uh, some of the house lights back up on, and uh, what we'll do is we'll just take questions from the audience, and uh, so if you um, can raise your hand, and I'll call on you, and we'll have our speakers answer your questions. Okay, yes, way in the back, back there. So the question is, uh, the binary uh, that we see um, around Dinkinesh, why haven't they crashed into each other? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's an orbit around it. Yeah, same reason why the moon hasn't crashed into the Earth, right? If things are moving fast enough, they just stay in orbit. Okay, yes, down here. Okay, so after Lucy has finished its main mission, you or me. where will Lucy, Lucy end up? Yeah, so Lucy will remain on an eccentric orbit, uh, which goes pretty much from Jupiter distance from the sun all the way back to Earth, and keep doing that for uh, millions of years. So uh, it will not crash on a planet, will not land anywhere, will just be on that, on that orbit for, for a long time. So Lucy will become a fossil to be discovered by some future <laughs> alien civilization. Yeah, if, if, yeah, matter of fact, right? Um, those, of you, uh, those of you who are a little older probably remember that NASA has a history of putting plaques on their spacecraft, right? Um, particularly the Pioneer spacecraft had a plaque. Those were messages to aliens in case somebody picks it up someday. Because of Lucy's orbit, Right, it's going to be stable for millions of years. So we put a plaque on Lucy, right, that it are, contains messages to our ancestors. Uh, I mean, our descendants. Right, we've uh, went around and collected messages from uh, cultural leaders, uh, all the Beatles, and at least the ones who are alive, and uh, put it on the plaque. So look it up. It's a pretty cool feature of the of the mission. How about someone from this side of the audience? Is anyone here? Yes, we over here. Meters, meters, yeah. So these are the dimensions of the asteroids in meters? In, in that chart, yes. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. So, so in Hal's ta um, talk, um, uh, the, um, he was wondering how many of those bodies were um, created from accretion um, as opposed to bodies that were the result of collisions uh, between larger bodies. Uh, well, the real answer to that question is yes. <laughs> right? So it, it's a mixture, and it depends what small body reservoir you're in. Right? If you look at the asteroid belt, for example, Dinkinesh, about, by the way, you were thinking about how small it is, only about 700 meters in diameter. We call it Dinky for short, no offense, <laughs> because it's so small, okay. Um, so so um, the main ast asteroid belt it has had a lot of collisional evolution. So for example, Dinkinesh is probably only uh, 12 to 15 million years old before it will break apart due to an impact. 
So there are regions where you have a lot of collisional evolution. The Trojans seem to be intermediate, which is why we still have polymelody, which looks like it's a primordial shape, right? And if you get out to the cold classical Kuiper belt, they're probably all primordial. So it depends on where you are. We can, we can guess, right? For example, um, we uh, believe that Dinkinesh is a collisional fragment because we know the collisional lifetime of an object like that is very short, right? I mean, 12 million years to us is very short, right? Um, you look at other bodies, like I said, Palomelli, which is that hamburger-shaped thing, or the cold classical Kuiper belt, you can guess because of the shape, whether they formed from a collapse, like I was showing, or as a as a function of being bro broken apart. So I'm going to call up on a, a young person who has his hand up. And just a note to all the other young people in the room, if you uh, have a question, um, you're more likely to be called on than some of the old fogies. <laughs> so definitely. If you have a question, um, feel free to raise your hand. So, so yes, way in the back, in the center. So why do asteroids, um, why don't the asteroids crash into Lucy? So how does Lucy manage to stay away from the asteroids? You want to take that? Sure. Um, so like as take turns, right? Yeah. Um, so as Hal mentioned in his talk, this, these asteroids are very far apart one from another. And so the, the chances that if you fly by the asteroid belt that you randomly hit one asteroid is basically zero. So, um, so that's why the spacecraft uh, survives. And all the prior spacecraft that have ever been sent in outer space, that there was never a case where uh, spacecraft disappeared because of an unintended collision with, with an asteroid. Okay. Yes, sir, way in the back there? Yes, you. Um, so if this satellite is going to stay on this orbit forever and it's solar powered, um, do you get any more useful data from it to keep checking in with it, or are you going to run out of propellant or just run out of something? So the question is um, since Lucy will be on this perpetual orbit, how long can you continue to use Lucy since it's solar powered? Does it run out of propellant? Are there other consumables that are used up? Well, there are consumables on board, right? There's enough what we call margin, right? We were conservative enough in the design that it should still be functional at the end of its mission, right? Um, mm -hmm. Typically what happens uh, is that if a spacecraft is still uh, useful, that, that the team will uh, submit a proposal to NASA to ask to do something different with it. Uh, I won't do that. I'll be retired but in 2033, but uh, Simone, who will take over for me, could very well have decided to do an extended mission and ask NASA to do something else. There, there, if there are enough, no, you don't ask questions. <laughs> Excuse me? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> the the uh, um, so you know you my guess is somebody will try to use the spacecraft as long as there's enough fuel and other resources left over and there should be. Okay. So before we go to the question for Don, I, uh, there is another young person right over here who has their hand up. So um, speak, um, shout your question. How did Lucy die? Uh -huh. How did Lucy die? Well, you know, it, what's fascinating about all of these fossil ancestors we find, there are very few of them for which we can be absolutely certain of why they died, uh, especially if it was a, a cancer, for example, which certainly wouldn't preserve in the fossil record, or some infection, for example, that we wouldn't know about. Uh, in the case of Lucy, there, uh, and the question is, was perhaps she taken by a carnivore, you know, and, and eaten? Usually there are tooth marks on the bones that you can see, 
And in the Lucy pelvis, there's one little cavity or one little puncture mark. And we know that that puncture was made around the time of death, because if you look at it with just a, a little lens, you can see the little bone splinters that, are, that were broken at the time and remain in place. They have not been removed. And this, this puncture was not made after the bones rolled out of its uh, ancient layer where it was fossilized. Uh, it was pretty close to a lake margin. Uh, and as, I, as you saw, we reconstructed her for this Nova series walking along a beach. Uh, primates are water dependent. We have to drink every day. And uh, maybe she was down uh, scooping up some water. She might have been down collecting turtle eggs. We know that we found round turtle eggs in the layer where she was found, as well as more egg-like shaped crocodile eggs. Maybe she was down gathering those and caught uh, un, uh, by a crocodile. Uh, but we don't know exactly how she died, and as we know about, we don't know that for many of the other fossils that we find. Uh, she was probably around 12 years old or 11 years old when she died in terms of years. She matured more quickly, like chimpanzees do. We take a long time to mature, as we know, if you've had children. <laughs> and... and even, even when children are supposedly uh, old enough to vote and drink and so on, we're fairly uh, careful about wondering if they really are mature. But I'm talking about a, a, an anatomical maturation. So she, she matured more quickly, more like um, uh, apes, for example. We have very long periods of childhood because we have so much to learn, as you've heard tonight. Uh, and to become a functioning human being. Uh, but in Lucy's case, uh, that's, that's all we, we really know is from this one puncture mark. Now, I alluded to a group of fossils of her species that came from one geological horizon. And these were large adults, which presumably were males, small adults, which were uh, probably uh, females, and uh, even infants and children. And there are no cut marks on those bones. There are no um, carnivore marks on those bones. Uh, it, was, it was what we would call a catastrophic death uh, that wasn't just selecting old individuals or only weak individuals or whatever. And we still don't know how that accumulation occurred. It's called the first family. Uh, it's what gave us an enormous insight into the biology of these creatures. But uh, even in that case, we thought it was a flash flood. The geologists looked at the geology very uh, intensely at, and, uh, at a microscopic level, and there's no evidence for fast-moving water. So those are mysteries that we, we may never solve. All right, so yeah, yeah, we had a, a second question for Don. So are, have the Australopithecus afarensis um, species been found outside of the Afar region, or have they been exclusive to Afar? Yeah, they, they seem to have been a very uh, inquisitive species. Uh, we know that uh, geologically they uh, lived as a species, Homo sapiens, all of us sitting in this room, as far as I can tell, <laughs> are all one species. And as we are today, we know that anatomically we're probably between 200 and 300,000 years we obtained our, our anatomical characteristics of, of, as Homo sapiens in Africa. Uh, we don't know uh, when we acquired many of our mental capabilities, but let's say that it was, you know, 150,000 years ago. Uh, and we think... Homo egocentricus, that I like to call ourselves, think that we're just going to go on forever. 
uh, Lucy species lived for 800 to 900,000 years, which meant that she was very adaptable to different climate changes and different environments. And we know that she spread uh, into what is today uh, Kenya, uh, into what is today Tanzania, where the footprints were found. There's one uh, mandible out in north central Africa in a country called Chad, which I would assign to her species. So she seems to have been a species, or it seemed to be a species, that was actually able to live in, in dramatically different geographical regions of Africa. So she has indeed been found uh, in other places. Okay. Um, how about um, way in the back? Yeah. Okay, so a similar question to before. How, do, how does the Lucy spacecraft not crash into the satellites of the asteroids? It's just a matter of space. Lucy has its space. Uh, there are not a lot of them around, and so the chances of, hit, of hitting something is really small. Right? If you think about it, the, the, the um, size of a satellite uh, like the one we found around Dinkanesh, is small compared to the whole area of, of its orbit, right? So the chances that it's at the same place that Lucy is at the same time is really small. All right, how about a question on this side of the room? Wait. Yes, sir? So the uh, question is, uh, we know that um, something like 99% or more of, of the species that have ever lived are now extinct. And so that, does that imply, I mean, what does it imply for the chances of us as a species? Yeah. <laughs> Bad luck. <laughs> the, the paleontologists tell us that some 99% of all species that have existed on this planet have gone extinct. And uh, all of those species, I would say, largely, uh, were not bringing about their own extinction. <laughs> uh, as uh, a, our, our living species is. Uh, we are damaging the planet so drastically, so dramatically, so precipitously, that it's as if we're committing a slow suicide which is a, a strange way to look at it because here we are, the most intelligent creature we know of in this solar system and uh, elsewhere, and we are the only ones who have the ability to solve this problem. Uh, many of those species that went, uh, you know, dinosaurs, for example, they couldn't have done anything uh, to prevent. We now could prevent an asteroid, and hopefully it isn't the Donald Johansson asteroid, <laughs> that comes to our planet, uh, we're we could destroy an asteroid like that. We've, we've seen that recently, that we have struck one and it moved its, its uh, trajectory. Uh, the dinosaurs had no way of, of, of changing the outcome of their lives. So I think that when you look at what I like to call the grim reaper of, of evolution, uh, extinction, uh, that it seems to be more the rule than survival. Uh, so I think that there is certainly a possibility that maybe Lucy Craft will be out there three million years from now going around and none of its originators still alive. Yes, sir.
Okay, so the uh, questioner is asking about the slide um, showing the um, evolutionary tree or bush uh, with Lucy kind of at the center and Homo sapiens off in the upper um, right corner. And he was wondering if you could trace the path from Lucy to us today in that diagram. Well, um, you know, it's a lot easier to trace our path from us to Lucy as we look back in time. If you look at a braided river, for example, it's a lot easier to get upstream than downstream. Uh, Lucy, we, we hypothesize, and this is a hypothesis, this family tree I showed. And most anthropologists have developed their own versions of the family tree. But when one looks at the detailed anatomy of Lucy's species, and these skulls were particularly important, as were the lower jaws and teeth, that around three million years ago, her species vanishes from the fossil record. And subsequent to that, we have two, at least three, and maybe more, but we have three evolutionary trajectories that emerge that have resemblances anatomically to Lucy's species. One led to a very specialized group of hominins, they used to be called hominids, but hominins that were very specialized in their anatomy with massive jaws and huge teeth and enormous crushing and grinding uh, muscles like big chewing muscles that, like the temporalis and the masseters and so on and were probably in a very, adapted to a very narrow niche that went extinct about two million years ago. And then there's a, another branch which uh, led to, as far as we know, only a single species, Australopithecus gari, uh, which has uh, a very big teeth, but it has other numerous resemblances to Lucy species. And we, and the uh, vegetarians I just mentioned, like Boise Ayers and Janthropus, the one that was found at Olduvai in 1959, there is an intermediate one between Lucy's species and that discovery at Old Divides, it's 1.8 million. And uh, this is at about two and a half million, and it's got a projecting face like Lucy's species, but it's got enormous molars like its descendants. So we have some transitional forms that allow us to substantiate that particular lineage. The other lineage, which uh, gives rise to a unique <coughs> genus, which, uh, which is homo, which is Latin for uh, man or human, um, there's a, uh, there's, the, the evidence is, is, is not prolific, but there is a lower jaw or a mandible that's uh, about 2.8 million years old uh, that appears to look like Lucy's species in the anatomy of the front of the jaw but in the back of the jaw looks very much like the genus Homo. So we think that Lucy's species gave rise to these three different evolutionary lineages. And uh, there were uh, certainly other fossils that followed, like uh, some of the early Homo material found at Lake Turkana, uh, some of the first to get out of Africa, I think. Uh, Rudolf Ensis, as it's called, and, uh, or Gaster, I should say. And uh, Neanderthals, we thought, when I was a graduate student back in the Stone Age, um, we thought we evolved from Neanderthals. I think most of those people are in Congress, but... Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, I think you're right. But... but um, we now know that even though we were separated for maybe 600,000 years, we weren't different enough species that we interbred with one another. So the, the emergence of our own species, Homo sapiens, again seems to be in Africa. So uh, it's difficult to, to, to know precisely because we don't have enough fossils. We don't have enough fossils geographically widespread. And uh, in a way, I think we, we will always be very significantly challenged uh, about the precise path that was taken 
Uh, in fact, uh, it, it, if, if you look at it and the probabilities of being here, they're, they're vanishingly small. And that's why I say we should really cherish the fact that our ancestors survived and involved into this highly inquisitive species, which we call Homo sapiens. Thank you so much to our, let's hear it for our presenters, please. And uh, thanks, Kachun, for uh, moderating. Um, Don, thank you so much for bringing up the 2001 uh, connection here. I secretly have a wish that the next mission will be called Barbie. So anyway, <laughs> so just a, just a suggestion. Not sure about that. <laughs> um, we have a reception. Uh, we, we hope all of you are able to come. If you're not able to, um, we, uh, um, well, let me just tell you about the reception. We've got all kinds of yummies over there. We've got a cash bar. You'll actually be to see a model of the Lucy spacecraft. Mm -hmm. Those of you that are on the Lucy team, so that we can, uh, so that people can find you. There's this, the, the stickers that we were talking about. You can get it at the Lucy table, so that you can identify yourself, so people can ask you more questions. Um, we ask that everybody exit out into the museum. This allows our staff to, to, to close the theater faster. You'll end, exit on both of these sides, all the way down. Cheyenne's over there, uh, waving. There we go. So you walk out into the museum. You'll pass some bathrooms if you need it. The atrium is that way, on the other side of this wall. You'll see a, you'll see a, a curtained area, and that's where you go in for the reception. Uh, if you need, if you're not able to go down the stairs and you want to go up in the elevator, exit up at the top over there. You'll end up on the third floor. There's an elevator that will take you down to the first floor, and you'll go into the atrium. Uh, and again, we ask if you're if you're leaving to everybody when you leave, exit out in the main entrance uh, on the north side. In addition to having ha having uh, the reception, we also have Space Odyssey open for you on the west side and Prehistoric Journey on the third floor. There is also Wild Color is open, but there's a, it's a special members' night that's a private event. So come back. Don't go to Wild Color. <laughs> go to the reception. <laughs> Get a cookie. And, um, and come back for Wild Color. It's a really great exhibit. Um, Ice Ages is also, the Mystery of Ice Ages is also open. That, in, that is included in your admission. So come back for that. Um, and um, yeah, thank you again. Uh, one more applause, round of applause for these amazing uh, scientists. Kathy? Yes. Good. Thank you for coming and helping us. Yeah. Thank you again for coming. We'll see you at the reception. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. He uh, told me about uh, Salam. Uh huh, uh huh. Well, I didn't reveal the name. No. Because we're waiting to be, you know, approved. You still have your mic on. Yeah. Is it on? Or? Yes. Yeah. Okay. What do we, we give this to whom? Yeah, I guess I can take it. No, I'll just give it to you. Yeah,